Good morning, my fellow yogic travelers. I'm mighty glad to be alive today, and I hope that you are too. Continuing my tribute to Robert Bly, uh, one of the things he's done is he's also connected interpretations of alchemy to certain indigenous rites of passage, symbolized by what he calls the red, the white, and the black. Now, although this is, to a great extent, a generalization and therefore a reduction of certain conditioning patterns that are available for the majority of people, and I always admit that most of this is what I would refer to the cisgender, the norm of binary thinking of male and female, but even if we acknowledge the amount of other people who don't identify with that or see themselves as something different, it still doesn't mean that the milieu in which those people try to find their own identity is not influenced in some way by the cultural norms for the greater majority. So in alchemy, the idea of the red, the white, and the black can be seen as first you begin with what they call the prima materia, the gunk of your life. That's the stuff you have to work with. And so that's called nigredo, the blackening, the dark stuff. But in order to transform it, you have to in some way purify it, which is called albedo. You have to do those practices which help you clear away the stuff that impedes you, holds you back, the obstacles. Even if at first the obstacles seem to be taking you away from your way, eventually the obstacles turn out to be your way. And so as you purify and you get clearer, or you straighten, your, straighten up, as we say, get your act together, all of a sudden the intensity, the commitment, what I call turning up the Bunsen burner, heating up the experiment, that becomes the next stage, which is called rubido, the reddening. And so as you purify yourself, you commit yourself more and more to working on whatever it is that you want to achieve or whatever it is that you need to confront um, to get out of the way to help you fulfill your potential. And then that makes you see more clearly the, the gunk, the dark stuff. And so that pattern repeats. You go deeper into the dark stuff, you purify yourself, and you continue to expand the teaching of intensity, or in yoga we would call it sadhana, the practices that you do on an ongoing basis uh, to keep you on the path. Now how that refers to stages in your life of what I would call the red, the white, and the black for men and women would be something like this. It's easy to see how men are conditioned and supported in the red in their early life. That means aggressive energy, whether it's carousing around and young bucks playing sports and vying for the affections of um, young women who are looking to see who's powerful and who's potential as a, as a mate. So this is deep, deep energies. And so we give aggressive energy to the young men as they play sports and go into the military and so forth. But after you've learned to work in that area, it gets tiresome. And by the time you're in your late 30s or early 40s, you realize this is not the way. You want to pull back a little bit. I don't want to be on the battlefield all the time. And so in that case, you start to work on yourself. I want more downtime. I want to retire. I want to go to the garden. I want to play golf. I want a vacation, whatever it is. I want a softer approach. And then as you do that, you begin to contemplate in your midlife, if you live that long, and there's no guarantee you will, the dark side, end-of-life issues, whether it deals with having to put your own grandparents or parents to rest, or maybe even your spouse or your children or your friends. But by now you've seen people have already passed on and you confront your own mortality, and that leads you into the black and dealing with your shadow issues. Uh, as we say in the fairy tales for elders, first comes self-confirmation, uh, self-confrontation, then comes self-purification, and then self-transformation. And then you end up embracing the dark. And the same thing is true for women, except with one small shift, is that women get conditioned and supported 
in the white to be supposedly pure, demure, nice, you know, ladylike, all those things that oppress women in patriarchy. But nonetheless, there's no doubt that that's the first way that women are conditioned. But by the time they get to midlife, they don't want to listen to that teaching anymore. They've been oppressed too long, so then they move from the white to the red. And now they're just kicking ass and taking names and coming out into the public sphere in a way historically that's never happened before with so many women at the same time. The future is female, so I like that. But at the same time, no matter how much they go into the red and start their own businesses or be not so focused on the family and really deal with their own personal needs, eventually it comes back to the black as well. At a certain point uh, in their own anatomy, any kind of um, beauty-oriented society telling you how you should look, what glamour is all about, uh, your body starts to go south and you can't use any kind of supposedly feminine wiles or charm like you might have done uh, in your early cheerleading days or your nubile mating phase. Uh, that, that has gone south. And if you don't add a, connect the medial woman or what I call the crone, the juicy crone, into your life, it's harder to get into the dark. But in the end, you get into the black as well. And that's where men and women meet, um, sharing their life wisdom uh, as they face end-of-life issues as well. So that's a little synopsis about the white, the red, and the black, whether it's looked at from the alchemical point of view or from many societies, indigenous uh, people who have white, black, and red as symbolism for how they take youths through the early part of their life, the middle part of their life, and the end of life. Reflect on that.